Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, if you have any problems with an Airbnb rental, I am not the person to see. We'll give you the 800 number afterwards. Um, but what we want to talk about is really um, identity and trust and how they play together, how they feed off each other in, this, in these new economies that keep popping up, whether that's ride sharing, whether that's home sharing, any sort of sharing. There is always that reliance on trust. And so we're going to talk with this panel about that today and hopefully give you guys some insights on, you know, what is being done about that? What is being thought of? What are some of the challenges that these uh, companies see? Uh, before we get started, uh, introduce, uh, everybody will introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Philip Burley. Uh, I also work at Airbnb as a product manager on the identity side, and I'm also an advisor for One World Identity. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Wenba? Yeah, this is Wenbo Zhang. Uh, I'm a senior manager at Fraud Risk uh, at Lyft. So before Lyft, I worked for PayPal also for three years, so mostly in the fraud and risk space. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Clark. I'm the general manager of the identity business at MyTech. Um, at MyTech, we specialize in bringing identity verification products to the global market. Hi, everyone. I'm Roger Desai, I'm CEO of Payphone. At Payphone, we help identify a phone behind a transaction. So this year, we'll be processing 50 million authentications a day um, for six of the top 10 banks in the US. Hi, I'm Anjali. I'm the product lead for risk management at Airbnb. Um, prior to that, was with Philip at Google and uh, with Wenbo at PayPal. So we do all know each other, yes. Um, all right, so let's let's kick it off. Um, you know, easy question to start. You know, just to warm the panel up. Uh, Wenbo, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, but what does identity mean, and how does that relate to trust? So I was just kidding about the easy question. <laughs> all right. Um, the way I think about it is, uh, so I guess I can add, add maybe one more thing. Because uh, you talk about share economy, I think the, the way I look at the share economy, the difference is uh, uh, in share economy, uh, compared with the traditional economy, you know, the merchant can be uh, any individuals. Right? So I think for share economy, you know, really have, for me, I live, for example, we have two sides, right? You have the driver side and you have the uh, passenger side. For driver side, where, uh, you know, the identity actually is key for, you know, the trust of the platform, you know, for the security of the passenger and the transaction. On the flip side, on the passenger side, what I think is uh, identity is, uh, is kind, of a, kind of like a trust token that uh, if we have it, uh, it can help, you know, make sure the transaction will go smoothly and, uh, you know, everybody have a good experience. So uh, it's a good addition and uh, it helps kind of enhance the overall experience for, for the platform. Anjali, anything to add there? Um, what is trust? What does identity mean in your in your role, basically? Yeah, um, I mean, identity is uh, you know it's distinguishing features. Um, you can identify yourself, you know, broadly. I can identify myself of you know with my culture and say you know I ident my identity is that I'm Indian. I can also say you know identity is a distinguishing feature. I'm a woman, and that's what I believe is my identity. I can also say Anjali Jane. That's my name, and that's part of my identity. Um, so identity can mean a lot of different things, and um, you know I feel like it's a very overloaded word because it's hard to really understand what level we're talking about in a lot of different conversations. Trust is um, reliability, uh, you know, the belief of reliability. Um, you know, sharing economy, trust is really the basis of it. And we're really trying to establish so that Airbnb can trust hosts, Airbnb can trust guests, but also that hosts and guests can trust each other. Um, and so as Airbnb, we really, really believe that trust is a fundamental factor for us. Um, identity would be, you know, one building block towards that. Yeah, and so, you know, Roger and Sarah, how did you guys evolve with these markets, right? I'm sure, you know, you guys were looking at these economies and saying, how do we help there? Maybe, Sarah, you could start. Um, sure. So I agree with everything that Anjali said. Um, but the way that we think through identity is basically the fact that you're dealing with a real known person. Um, and I would say that we think of that as being the absolute foundation for trust. If you define trust as being that that person is likely to behave honestly and responsibly. So kind of the opposite of that is what you see with respect to fraud. 
Um, and within financial services, the majority, not all, but the majority of fraud is in fact performed by those that are using a stolen or synthetic identity. So in that context, when you look at it, knowing you're dealing with a real person is really key um, to trust and to preventing fraud. Um, and this type of digital fraud that, you know, the sharing economy is a digital business model for the most part, and digital fraud is rising at um, really pretty alarming rates. Um, if you look at in-person fraud at POS, that's been steady or declining, about $5 billion, partially because of the advent of EMV. But if you look at digital fraud, um, it's been rising, right? So Javelin just released a report where card not present fraud increased by 40% in 2016 compared to 2015. Account opening fraud has been rising by maybe 3x. Um, so the concept of trust uh, being needed um, within financial services or a sharing economy transaction um, is greater than ever before. And at that foundation, um, it's, it's a must to know that you are in fact dealing with a real um, individual, AKA the foundation of identity. So Roger, obviously, telco, payphone, mobile devices, you know, people, people believe that might be the link, right? How do, you, how do you guys think about these new economies and how you guys play in there? So, uh, you know, your first question about, you know, our definition of identity is a lot of money that is left on the table. So if you look at our lives, uh, in digital, every relationship you create, like you join Frontier Airlines loyalty program, or you register at Best Buy, or you're basically a shithead until proven otherwise. Right? I mean, you're just not. Can you speak in the mic and just repeat that? You're basically a shithead until <laughs> proven not proven otherwise. Like if you think about it, like you could. You know, so I'm like really high on Delta. The other day I was on Frontier. I was like the worst seat imaginable. I would have chosen the toilet. Like it was like <laughs> the last row, middle, and I saw aisle seats that were available. To me, that's an identity problem. If they knew that, you know, I may spend thirty to forty thousand dollars a year on travel, and I, you know, have a company that spends, you know, a lot on travel, they should have been like, "Hey, dude, like, you know, we, you know, welcome to the frontier. You never use us, but you know, here's an IC. Not even first, just not near the shitter would be preferred." <laughs> so identity is about uh, just catching up with, um, you know, of the fact that we want to do more business with people. Now, I'll give you one example. Your phone is the only thing you use in which you don't have to assert your identity. So you don't have to log into at t to use your phone. You can take your phone to New Zealand. It doesn't say, welcome, here's some coupons, you know, who are you and how do you want to pay for these calls? It just works. So, and by the way, they don't say, you can make one call a day, and if you're a good boy, after a year, you can make two calls. They don't think you're a shithead. They're like, hey, I don't know you, but I just asked at t and they vouch for you. I mean, the phone people, that, I'm one of them, so I can say this have figured out uh, how to federate trust already. Your phone works everywhere. You know, $1.3 trillion was processed through a SIM card last year. So anyway, I think to, to us, you know, the fact that the phone is the only thing you don't have to assert that it's your phone is a, an ingredient, I think, in solving the problem. Great. Um, anyone tweeting shithead, I don't know if that'll <laughs> go through. So be careful. Um, so Anjali, I'll start with you this time. but. You know, speaking about identity, you, you mentioned there's a lot of levels of identity or layers of identity that we can think of. What are some of the important ones um, that you're looking at in, you know, at Airbnb between guests and hosts in the platform? Yeah, um, you know, I think in the investing session yesterday, um, someone said it nicely, uh, and very similar to how we think about it, there is what you're born with, and that's part of your identity. But then there's also what you choose to represent about yourself, and that's also part of your identity. I think those are you know, two uh, different aspects that we weigh in pretty heavily, along with the third factor, which is reputation. And so how do we make sure we're getting a feedback loop on what you're providing um, by other people who are interacting with you? So I think those would be three cornerstones of identity that we take pretty seriously. Wenbo, what would you say is the most important uh, element of data or of the identity that you guys look at? Yeah, so the way um, I look at it is, uh, so for us, consumer identity, really, you have two pillows. Uh, one is uh, the ident identifier, so it means like IDs, or you know, sometimes could be phone number is your identifier. The other pillow is, uh, is your data in terms of behavior, behavior data. So you know, in some cases, for example, uh, you know, when you have a new user, you really don't have a lot of uh, user behavior data with them yet. But you probably have a strong like identity information by collecting IDs, 
So in that case, you, you, you think you have a good uh, you know, picture of the people's identity. But later on, as user, you know, transact on your platform, then you have more behavioral data, and then in that sense, you probably rely less on the uh, you know ID, ID information or ID, identifier that you collect late, uh, early on. So it's actually a kind of a dynamic kind of system. So I don't I think both pillows are important, and uh, you know and uh, in uh, in practice we use both in our kind of day to day decisions. You know, it leads me to the next thing is you know how how do you turn identity from a one-time interaction, right? Whether it's an ID, whether it's an SMS verification, you run a check on a name address date of birth, how do you turn that into a ongoing authentication of that identity, right? We verified the driver, we verified the host at one time, how do we ensure it's continuously the same person that's interacting with these platforms? Maybe Sarah or Roger, any thoughts around that? Um, well, I think we know what Roger's going to say. It's going to yeah. start with shithead. <laughs> um, I'm not going to start with shithead, but maybe I'm going to answer a different question than you just asked okay. <laughs> because that's not um, that sort of repeat identification or building the reputation is not really the business uh, that that we're in. Uh, but I can share a little bit more about that initial step of checking for the ID uh, because that is my area of expertise. Um, so just one interesting fact, I think, about the sharing economy and the statistics underlying this huge growth segment. Um, sometimes it feels like everyone is booking an Airbnb or um, participating in the sharing economy, and I certainly don't know the individual usage stats for, for any company, but one of our partners, Huyu, did a recent survey about actual penetration rates in the sharing economy, and it's really about, in the U.S. and the U.K., 15% or less of individuals have participated. Um, and there's lots of reasons behind that, but one of the biggest drags on uh, more growth in that sector is in fact ID confidence. Um, so within that survey, they found that 70% of people said they will not participate in a big ticket sharing economy transaction unless they would see identity confidence as part of the platform. 80% um, said that would make them a lot more likely to participate more often. So this notion of the first step in terms of collecting an ID and knowing that you're dealing with a real person is really important for the growth of the sharing economy in general. And uh, I think the good news is that the technology um, is at the point where that's certainly very possible to do through a digital interaction. So kind of that um, old school uh, exchange of ID where I go to rent a hotel room and I show you my ID and you look at me and say, yeah, that's you. Um, that's sort of the accepted paradigm um, for doing that. And if you think about it, the level of reliability in that is very, has a wide range. Some clerks barely look, and some are going to actually use a hardware device or something to do a reasonably good job. When shifting that to digital, um, what's really cool is we can take that concept that a government-issued ID is, in fact, a very reliable indication, if it's checked well, that you are who you say you are, because they're hard to get and they have security features that make it relatively easy to assess that they were um, issued. Um, and when you take that to digital, you can actually create something that works better than an in-person interaction. So mobile is a key, uh, being able to scan for IDs, being able to scan for faces, and the advances in computer vision, uh, deep learning, where you can actually scan for embedded and sometimes invisible security features. Uh, can put a lot of trust in the identity result and a lot of trust into the sharing economy um, that I think is really key for spurring growth. And that's what we focus on at MyTech, and I think it's, it's pretty exciting technology. So Roger, now they're in, right? ID's verified. How do, you, how do you get this relationship and it stays the same person? How do you guys play in there? So I like to remind myself of my younger days when if you went out to a club, you go through... You know, these great examples. No, but you get like, you know, you go through all the crap once, and then you get a bracelet or a stamp, and then if you have to go out for a smoke, you don't have to go through that shit again. So, I mean, ultimately it has to be like a passport, right? We don't have to go through proving it's ourselves at every border if we just have a passport. So we need a digital equivalent. And in our world, the way we do it at Payphone is there's initial kind of identity proofing to know it's your phone to begin with. And the ground truth for that may be the phone company. That's pretty good in the U.S., but in India, it could be Adar, the uh, kind of the government system. It could be a, a bureau. But the, there's a ground truth they use to know that, hey, this is Philip's phone to begin with. 
And then when you bind him to that phone, I think you know what we do is we create a mobile ID for you. And that ID is anchored to you as a person, not to your device. So in the US, for example, a payphone gets 8 million events from the phone companies every day. Every time you change your phone number, disconnect your line, upgrade your phone. And we take that, and we're essentially triaging and man maintaining these IDs. So we always know it's you know your payphone ID number 52, for example. So that's our scheme. But ultimately, you need a scheme um, like we've all been accustomed to at a club, where you only have to go through crap once, and then you can have fun. Uh, or like the way your passport works. It should just be the first time, and then you persist these IDs behind the scenes. So building on that, right? So we have the ID, we have the bracelet. Anjali, what else, what else should we be looking at in the, because obviously two signals seems a little weak, so what, else, what other signals are you looking at for this established identity uh, to continue to be able to trust that? So I, I don't think identity is a one-time event. I mean, from the time a user signs up all the way through when they've created a transaction and even following up from beyond that on understanding how it went, um, and whether they're going to come back throughout that entire life cycle, there are data elements to capture um, that will help build identity or help build a profile. Um, and so, you know, how much you ask at any given point in time, I think that depends on, you know, where the user is in a life cycle. But I, I don't think identity should be considered a one-time event. Um, you know, we've we've talked a lot about um, techniques and ways to do things, email verification, phone verification, ID verification. You know, we've also talked about behavioral analytics and, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of data there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that there are many pieces towards, towards um, grasping identity throughout the life cycle. Wimbo, besides, besides that original, that first touch point, what, what are you guys focusing on um, when it comes to trusting that identity? Yeah, I will probably give an example of, uh, you know, your device, right? So when you first sign up, you know, we first time see your uh, device fingerprints on the platform. Uh, and, you know, most people, you will probably the only fingerprints uh, that you will use. But maybe later on, we see new fingerprints pop out in the network, right? For example, you have a maybe, you know, iPad uh, sign up, or maybe your daughter use your, or your son use your phone. Or it could be uh, you log in account to us through a friend's phone. So all these kind of fingerprints will pop up during your life cycle. And uh, you know, those tells us more about the user and about your identity. Uh, not as, as maybe individuals, but even more about even your, like uh, at what we call entity level. So those are, I think, an example of like how this can evolve as you know, life cycle progress. Great. Um, so obviously, we've talked a lot about, oh, we should collect ID, we should collect mobile device, fingerprint, biometric. That's great, right? But that's all friction. So you know, putting on my growth hat, um, how, what is the ideal, I'd like you guys to answer two questions. What's the ideal scenario from an identity and a fraud side? If you could do whatever you wanted, how would you truly establish an identity? And then how would you, what's the bare minimum that enables growth, but you still feel comfortable about having verified that, that customer? When by maybe you could start. Yeah, I think from a fraud perspective, right, as I'm looking at the consumer side, um, you know, for me, the question really is like w not what optimum, uh, what's ideal, what looks like for me. Uh, it's more like what's minimum that I need for, uh, to function. Um, I think so um, because I, I know like, uh, I, you know, we, we were probably not able to function at a, you know, optimal world for uh, from fraud perspective because you know it's uh, really like I said a lot of friction to customers so for I think what minimum that's needed it really depends on the business uh, like I think uh, Edward Snowden said in yesterday's keynote you know you don't need uh, a lot of thing for uh, people to transact on Amazon I think for consumer to you know transact you know for for example to take a ride you know what do we need to know the user probably just we I want to know you know have we have I seen this user before you know, is it new user or first time user? You know, I want to know uh, because we are like um, app based, you know, company, so we will know their phone, uh, phone number, email address. You know, it would be great if we know your true kind of identity, but if you don't provide us for the first time, you know, as a passenger, we'll probably still let you to use the platform. So to avoid Roger having a middle seat near the shitter, Anjali, how do you make sure the new user gets a good experience while still having that trust? Yeah, I, I agree with what Wenbo said. You know, I think it really depends on the industry you're in and what level of transaction a user is is involved with. I mean, if you're a gamer and you know you're 
you're on a gaming app, maybe just having a user ID with a valid phone number and a credible payment instrument is good enough. If you're creating a bank account, maybe you know you require a higher level of KYC and regulatory requirements. Um, you know, sharing economy. I think we're at the beginning, and we're really trying to figure out and establish um, what level of trust do we need to provide. And from a risk management standpoint, on how do we manage, you know, our platform and keep it safe and of high integrity, but also between people, because these people are going to be meeting in the real world, and so you know you want to establish credibility there as well. Um, so I mean, I don't think that there is a great answer for it right now. Um, growth is always something that's important, and so you want to think about you know the minimal level of friction you need. But I think the constraints are risk management and building trust. Roger, to you nodding your head. Well, yeah, it was well said. Um, but I go back to I think there are some good examples. Again, you you don't have to do anything to use your phone. That doesn't mean Verizon knows if it's you on your phone, right? But that's where we can go back to what Anjali said about looking at other factors. Ultimately, it comes down to entropy, right? It's how much entropy is behind a transaction that you can you know make sure it's the person you enroll to begin with. So, you know, in our view, you enroll and you spend a lot of time doing that correctly. But then you can use factors that already exist to kind of give enough entry behind the scenes. So the phone has essentially 128 bit encryption. That's what your SIM card has. That would take you millions of tries or millions of years to break that. But I can just take your phone. So then, well, did we look at how you hold your phone, how you type? You know, so can you always have 120 bits of entropy with several factors that are behind the scenes? Um, I'd venture to say that like, you can open a bank account today and deposit in the branch a $300,000 $300, check. It'll cost the bank maybe $30 in process, and it'll be a pain in the ass because you got to go to the bank. Uh, you can open a bank account on your phone, and you can only deposit 10000 bucks, even though it only costs you know, $0.30 cents to process or $0.03 cents to process. And it's really convenient because you can do it at home. So that's the trust gap. And the question is, you know, how do you build that trust gap with enough entropy? I, I would think the fact that there's 120-bit encryption in your SIM, there's the fact that you can look at all the behavioral biometrics of how you use your phone, like in our network, if we're seeing 50 million authentications a day, if I see you log in to Citibank uh, with success every month, I see you doing something with your Blue Cross plan every month, that adds more entropy to our mobile identifier that we're discovering behind the scenes. So I think you need, at minimum, you need an identifier that tracks the human um, through all the noise of mobile, upgrades, phone number changes, and then you're adding entropy as you see that ID do things in the network. And if there's, and then there's just math. If there's enough entropy, you can tie that to authorization rules. So that's our scheme, and you know, but it's you know, we're one ingredient of a larger, you know, collection of things. I know, Sarah, you you my tech is in a lot of industries, financial services. Yeah. I'm sure you has you have some information of your clients where they see this friction or non-friction. Yeah, I mean, I agree, certainly, that it depends on the industry and the risk. Um, I do see as an overall trend um, strengthening of the front door, so to speak, so putting stronger identity verification into the enrollment process. Um, so what I would say not to do um, when we're talking about friction, um, don't, uh, if you were to create a sharing economy site from the ground up, don't ask your users a bunch of KBA questions. Um, a lot of our customers are coming to us to move away from that because it's A, not effective, and B, it's a lot of friction. Nobody knows the answer to what their mortgage was five years ago. Um, and there have been a lot of interesting studies that those that can answer all those questions correctly most likely are fraudsters um, and all sorts of other uh, problems with that, data breaches, et cetera. So the world is changing, right? You want to move away from relying solely on what you know factors. Um, when enrolling someone, and you want to move into the world of what you have and who you are factors. Um, the device, I think, is great. Um, the ID card is a what you have factor. And of course, the facial biometric is a who you are factor. And it's the, the technology in order to build these experiences so that uh, convenience and speed are not mutually exclusive with identity verification security. Um, the technology is there. So I would also say don't be afraid to have your users uh, go to mobile, right? So a lot of our customers um, have about a 50-50 split between mobile and desktop users. That's kind of the norm today. And we've seen a lot of successes where even if someone's enrolling from desktop, 
Uh, you have them go to their mobile device, and they can scan their ID, scan their face, and you also get all the benefits of being then uh, bound to a mobile device. It's a great user experience. It works well. It's what you have, who you are. And um, certainly in the US and the UK, uh, people don't mind switching to mobile um, as part of that enrollment process. So there's lots of new best practices that are emerging and lots of technology that's really interesting to create these lower friction, more secure um, identity verification experiences. Great, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the other, the other question I was, you know, there's identity plays in the compliance area, plays in the fraud area. It's, it's used by both areas. Um, I'm sure they overlap a lot, right? But where, where do they get to a fork where the fork goes left for compliance, right for fraud? Wimbo, when, when you guys look at it from a compliance side and a fraud side, where, where do you see them intersecting and where do they start to diverge? Yeah, I think go back to kind of uh, my kind of two pillow energy. Like I think on the identifier side, I see a lot of over overlapping like identifier meaning like IDs or you know your documentations uh, I think it's less of over overlapping on the behavior side although you know for uh, compliance perspective when you, you know KYC when you reach a certain threshold of transaction you start to enter that uh, you know uh, requirement of a compliance so just still like some overlaps there but I think not as much in terms of uh, identifier for me and Anjali do you do you think the They've split that way because regulations haven't caught up that they can get into this biometric game and really know who this person is besides the traditional name, address, date of birth, ID card? Yeah, I think compliance and risk are solving for two different problems. And even risk is pretty broad. Um, you know, compliance, you may break that down into um, anti-money laundering. You may look at that as sanctions, uh, you know, OFAC, et cetera. They're, you know, they're kind of all the key kind of check boxes that everyone is trying to get through on the compliance side. Um, you know, I definitely think regulation is, is something that needs to catch up and even country by country uh, varies. So I think compliance is an area where it's much more closer to policy because it's kind of a, a binary decision um, that needs to be made. Uh, risk management is very different. You know, you may be solving for account takeovers, you may be solving for fake inventory, payment fraud, um, you know, incentive abuse, um, all sorts of different problems. And handling each of those, um, a lot of data goes into that, you know, and a lot of it, you know, may not be the same identifiers that you use for, for compliance. For compliance, you know, establishing that identity in a valid, you know, name, date of birth, et cetera, might be way more important. Whereas from a risk management side, you know, having thousands of attributes might actually prove to be more valuable. Um, ultimately, risk management is about setting thresholds and, and really deciding your risk tolerance. Um, so I think they're just two completely different playing fields. And Roger, what do you, you know, with the phone, you know, being that binding device, having all that information, why haven't regulators caught on to that? Or have they caught on to it? Are they exploring it as a way to truly verify someone? It's a great, I, it's, um, you know, that stuff always kind of catches up and it lags. Um, and because we live in a world where, at least if you're serving American companies, they want, you to support them in you know 10, 20, 30 countries, and then you have to deal with the worst of whatever the policy out there is. So the EU is doing a lot around AML, for example, right? If you send more than 250 bucks to someone, you have the KYC both sides, or you can you know face uh, two percent of your global revenue as a penalty. That's you know that's pretty strong reason to prioritize that in your roadmap. Um, so we are seeing it. If you saw what NIST said recently about. Um, like, oh, gee, I didn't realize people could intercept text messages. Oh, shit, maybe you shouldn't be using that. Uh, I think people are noticing that um, the framework we have in place, you know, moving from KBA, I mean, that's, I think it was a great point uh, that was brought up. But I mean, most everything falls back to KBA. You could lose the most secure thing in the world, and then the way to get it back, like you pretend you lost it. I can pretend I'm you, and I lost the really secure thing. And then they use KBA to give me the new one. Like, you know, that's crazy. Um, so that's falling apart. Um, the band-aid of you know, two-factor SMS, OTPs, OTPs in general. You know, it's, there's nine ways to take over someone's phone number. There are five ways to forward your calls without you knowing. Like, I can send you an email. Just by opening the email, I can dial an HLR code that only forwards 
when Citibank calls you, to me, but nothing else. I mean, so all the kind of duct tape we use is going to, um, I think the regulars are noticing and looking for guidance. I mean, this is just talking to as many people as they can get to to get more perspective on what else they can do. You know, and it will be the things we're talking about. It'll be scanning IDs, it'll be biometrics, but, you know, it all comes down to, um, they're going to, well, ultimately they're going to want to see proof in the market, and I think uh, many of us, including, I think Payphone, are showing them good examples of that. Same question to you, Sarah. How, how have regulators been receptive to your solution? You know, they're used to the traditional bank, you know, interaction where I go in, show my ID, the hotel, same thing. How have they received the digital method of that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with the call out that the AML regs in Europe uh, tend to be sort of the most uh, progressive that are out there right now. They're kind of pushing the envelope. And um, I think they're pushing it uh, along two dimensions. I mean, one is just to loop back to the concept of, do you really want anonymous people uh, transacting on your platform? And um, the trend of the regulators is, no, you do not, because that has been linked to nefarious things that have happened in the world. Um, one of the new regs in Europe, for example, uh, forbids uh, anonymous prepaid cards um, from being widely purchased. The reason for that is they were used to fund the Paris bombings. Um, so as more of this is realized, less and less anonymous um, actions are being allowed for per the regs in the realm of financial services. And I think that's relevant to the sharing economy and other non-regulated sectors because um, there's a reason that people try to be anonymous. They may not have the best intentions. Um, the, uh, the other way that the regulators are pushing the envelope is um, they are relatively uh, aware of and beginning to embrace new types of technology. They're aware of digital transformation that's sweeping the globe. Um, and they are adding um, certain elements to the regulations that support that. As it relates to my business, I was very happy to see that in the AML regs in Europe, it explicitly states support for electronic versions of ID documents. Um, and it's becoming more widely embraced and rolled out that you can do that via mobile capture, along with a video chat or a selfie capture. And that's sufficient for highly regulated KYC um, interactions um, in Europe and other parts of the world at this point. Great. Um Wimbo, when, when you're looking at your business today, what is, what is your biggest challenge in this space right now? Um, so I think it's probably um, to reach kind of a balance between, you know, want to, I want to know my customer and I want to uh, collect information from them versus, you know, the friction I want to put up them through. So um, I think reaching a balance there and uh, uh, and how do you, do you kind of, uh, I know we, uh, in some panel we talk about the value proposition, you know, it's all about the value of your product, but uh, in our, you know, in our world, which is highly competitive, you know, there's a out, like alternative over there, like how do you communicate the benefit to the customer uh, and to, to convince, convince them to go through your process or to, you know, to uh, get to a point where you accumulate enough data that can you can, you know, build a trustworthy uh, profile or model on their behavior so that you can give them better experience. I think, you know, the, the, the challenge on the, you know, initial stage is, you know, it's hard for, from a kind of practical uh, perspective to distinguish good from bad. Uh, it's been the challenge we're facing today. Anjali, same question. You knew it was coming. As you were asking it, I was actually thinking, like, which challenge to go with? There are so okay. many. Um, I, would, I think our biggest challenges, um, you know, one is just collecting information globally. You know, each country has its own regulations, requirements. Um, you know, we operate in China, and so what we do there may be very unique to what we do somewhere else. You know, in Germany, they may not allow certain um, certain things, and so you know, it, it's just really interesting because there's no silver bullet on how you even collect identity information globally. Um, and that said, then, do you take a country-by-country country approach? Do you take a, you know, one-size-fits-all and then go exception cases? And, you know, how, how does that impact your user experience? Um, so the first challenge is just the collection of information globally. The second is verifying that information. Um, now you collect a whole lot of information. How do you actually verify that it's real and um, authentic? And, you know, I think another talk was going on about the dark web and how you can grab 
IDs and phone numbers and all sorts of different things, and you can intercept SMSs. And you know, at, at this point, um, you can you can get around and defraud anything. And so again, there's no silver bullet on verification either. So now you don't have a silver bullet on collecting. You don't have a silver bullet on verification. Then there's the okay, I've collected it, I verified it, but now how do I trust it? And how do I actually understand the reputation of it? Um, and that layer, you know, as a new user versus an existing user where I have behavioral information or performance information is very different. And so for those new users, how do I understand the credibility of that information? And especially in the sharing economy where that reputation matters because people will be meeting in the real world. Um, I would say those would be the three layers of challenges that That's I can... a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um, so uh, my last question, I'm going to leave a couple minutes for the audience to ask some questions as well as, you know, if you would have asked me five years ago if I would have gotten in a stranger's car or stayed at a stranger's house, I would have told you you were insane, right? So I want to ask the panel is, where, where do you see this space, whether that's your own space, the identity space, going in the next five years, right? It's accelerated so quickly, the last five, where does this thing go in the next five? So maybe Sarah, you could start. Um, well, I'm really excited about what I see with some of the government EID initiatives. Um, we act as a player in that ecosystem by helping upload folks into those programs. Um, I think it's really exciting what the UK government is doing with respect to making some of that open to private enterprise. And I think the future is just more consortium models, more centralized, um, and less friction, more sharing. Simply put. Great. Roger? So, I, yeah, I think that there's enough here for someone to... Uh, use it for a competitive advantage. And so I think two things will happen. So at Payphone, we think that at the next Fortune 100, one of the key determinants will be how much effort there is to do business with you. I think that's going to be a KPI. If it's hard to do business with you, you're going to lose revenue and your market cap's going to go down. And I think that's true for a lot. How just, we talk about brands, right? The ones that are easier to work with, we like to use. So I think people will break through this kind of you know, trade-off between security and and uh, convenience, because uh, the tools are there. I mean, we bring one, I think, really amazing tool to the table to do that. The second thing is, I think there'll be an interchange around identity. So the way that we all fully, like, we're all gonna become, we're all merchants, we're all consumers, right? That's just happening. And so the way that underwriting will work, the way that identity will work, it'll be, there'll be an interchange model that give, like, the beauty of MasterCard isn't the chip, right? I mean, it's a 6,000 person company that's worth $150 billion. Amex is 40,000 people and 45 billion, maybe 50 billion. I mean, it's not the chip, it's not the security, it's the model. So people haven't cracked the code on the business model to make this shit work, and I think that's what we'll see, mainly because I think th they'll be reordering in the Fortune 100 around one of these KPIs. Anjali? It's hard to say, you know, um, five years out, you know, you, you look five years ago um, and sharing economies, you know, weren't as big. Um, I definitely think sharing economies are only going to grow over the next five years um, and even get into spaces maybe that they're currently not in. Um, where do I think identity is going in the next five years? I mean, I think it's just we're going to continue hammering away at those challenges that I mentioned. You know, how do you get global scale? How do you verify at global scale? And how do you actually establish credibility behind that? Wenbo? Yeah, I think um, I agree with uh, what the uh, panelist has said. I think uh, uh, eventually, you know, hopefully we can break down the, uh, the tra trade-off we have to make between experience with the safety or trust, uh, and uh, um, we have a uni uh, kind of a uniform kind of platform that we can use for identity that can cross country and across industry and across companies. Great, that was all the questions I had. So if there's any audience questions, please feel free to come to the microphone. Please. Hi, I was uh, Tom Mathis, and I do a lot with uh, uh, data taxonomies and stuff like that. So we talked about identity. So you know, there's that we want to know to identify a person, but we use authenticate in our credentials or technology we use to uh, do that for us easily without getting all the knowledge or whatnot. And so there's like this small segment to our industry where uh, they, they provide assurance on identity data to identify someone, to facilitate authenticating them, to establish that identity. So your respective organizations, you have unique identities, and then you build what I call prof profiles, like relationships, like things people identify with, their behavior, reputation, or whatnot, which is within your boundary. 
do you ever see yourself, or do you see there's value in evolving where you, instead of using those services, you actually share down and share with each other? So all the corporate entities who have risk with people are now sharing that risk and their confidence levels for each of us. So I know I have a unique identity with everyone I work with, but that's not per se what they know about me is not shared within you know the industries. But do you see that as something where corporations say, hey, good deal, that's good for every, all of us, or hey, that, we don't wanna give up a competitive advantage because we have this ontology or model we're working with that you know, it's good for us. So do you see that transition ever occurring? Everybody's nodding, who's gonna take it? Yeah, I, I can take that. I mean, I think, you know, Facebook is a really great example of that where, you know, they've built um, an identifier for people, a, you know, a, a profile which you can um, have a lot of engagement and activity with. And now they've given out Facebook Connect where you can actually um, log in through Facebook on other websites. And as you log in with Facebook, you can actually get a set of data um, to help build that profile on the next step that that user takes. Um, I definitely think it's a valid, uh, a valid step to take when you feel like you have credible identity. So I, yeah, I absolutely think that is happening. That's what one of the value propositions that Payphone brings to the table. Now one, you have to make it a give-get, right? You can't get if you don't give, so you have to make it uh, something that people want to be in. But again, go back to the phone analogy that I, I so I, I was originally a switch engineer, which meant I worked with phones, and I saw the beauty, probably the only person to ever say this, of the phone system. But think about it. If you can bring your phone to anywhere in the world, and you don't have to create a new account, right? When you go to China, you're not creating an account there. And that's federated trust at a level that the web has not seen. So the model already exists, and it works. Um, and so the question is, you know, how do you create, um, kind of bring that to the web? So that's essentially what we've done with you know kind of our portion of the world, where if again if I create an ID for you and I'm kind of persisting you through your events, like if you port or change phone companies or whatever that you do, right? You're still the same ID in our system, and through the, for those who participate in our give get, I know I, that you've logged in successfully nine times today at these other sites, and that brings trust with you. I mean, essentially, it's a trust score. So when you create a like going back to the, the shitter example. Like if, if uh, Frontier knew that I had, uh, you know, like, like think of that the phone number and the phone will have a score like a FICO score. If they knew what my trust score was, perhaps they would have upgraded me, right? Or given me that aisle seat. That makes them more money and that will be the incentive. So I think the models are emerging and it's a phenomenal question because that's, that's where the network effect creates value for all participants. I, I <clears throat> completely agree that that's where the most value is. And that's one of the headwinds that we have because we would like to more aggressively pursue those types of models. But when you're dealing with PII, driver's licenses, passports, um, obviously there's a lot of um, concern and resistance around kind of sharing um, that type of um, information. Um, so at MyTech, we've been working on a variety of techniques to try to give our customers the best of what we can learn from all of the transactions in our cloud platform while respecting the boundaries of PII and not quite going to that pure consortium model. Uh, but that, that to me is the most you know, powerful sort of vision in order to really make um, an identity platform as valuable um, on a wide scale as possible. All right, I think we are actually out of time. Um, I hope this was uh, informative. I really enjoyed the conversation. I think we should definitely continue this. Um, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of issues, but there's also a lot of you know, push for solutions that are coming. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.